Happy Mother's Day. Glad uh, that you're here and going to spend some uh, time with, uh, with us and worshiping the Lord this morning. And whatever um, Mother's Day means for you, um, I know for, uh, for some it's a happy, joyful time. For some it's time of memories. Uh, for some it, it may be a difficult day. So whatever Mother's Day is for you, I got to pray God blesses you and um, you experience the Lord's joy in the way he means for you to experience a day. And um, we just pray for that for each of you. <clears throat> just one commercial. I um, hope you look in your worship folder uh, in Jim's jottings there. Uh, we have some wonderful training opportunities or growth opportunities for everybody this summer. I encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, Rosemary is going to have a uh, class, a small group, beginning in June on Sunday evenings. I think it starts at 6, Rosemary? <clears throat> oh, it's 6. Okay, listen to Rosemary, don't listen to me. And uh, it's on prayer, and it's going to be exploring um, ways to pray, different ways, different methods, and what prayer means. It's to help each of us go deeper and develop our prayer life. Um, I'm going to start in the middle of June, a small group for those that like to get up even earlier than 9.30. If you want to come at 8.30 and join me, uh, we're going to have a small group, going to have uh, maybe a brief devotional Bible study, but we want to focus on prayer too, um, how, to, you know, how to strengthen our prayer life or just praying together. And then on Wednesday nights uh, this summer, uh, throughout the summer, I'm going to come, I'm going to lead a, a class uh, really a sharing time and a class on, uh, on sharing our faith. I think a lot of people struggle with that or wonder about that. So the title of it is Sharing Jesus Without Freaking Out. Okay, We don't want to freak out. We want to share how to have some gospel conversations and uh, share the Lord. So you're welcome to come to those. I, uh, I hope that you do. Well, I appreciate Chuck sharing his testimony this morning and um, and also reading that passage from Mark, we are back near the beginning of Mark. We're going to march through a lot of the Gospel of Mark this year. Uh, Chuck read to you from the third chapter in those first six verses. And it, um, it, it tells an ongoing story of Jesus' confrontation and totally different mindset of a group that he always battled with. And that was the Pharisees, isn't it? And this is another occasion. It's the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus wants to heal a man with a withered hand. And uh, he sees and feels the stern looks from the Pharisees. And so he basically says, okay, is it better to, um, to obey the law on the Sabbath day uh, or to do good, to heal? And to prove his point, he heals the man and then, uh, he, it's interesting, Mark says, immediately he heals the, the man of, of his withered arm. And then it goes on to say, immediately the Pharisees get, got with the Herodians to plot to kill him. It's interesting, the Pharisees, it's not good to heal on the Sabbath, but it's okay to get together and plot to kill somebody. That's okay on the Sabbath. So, there's a lot of themes that can happen in this passage but the saddest thing I see in this, and the saddest thing I see in a lot of the Gospels, and still today, is the actions, beliefs, and lifestyle of the Pharisees. And throughout the Gospel, <clears throat> they continue to be so blinded by their needless laws, their tradition, their own position in society, that they let God himself, in the person of Jesus Christ, pass right before their eyes, and they never get it. Now, to remind you, the Pharisees were not even an official group. They were an unofficial, self-appointed group within the church that declared themselves as watchdogs so that everybody would keep all the rules and regulations. <clears throat> now, we know we can run into those kind of folks still today. Self-appointed watchdogs of the law to make sure everybody else, everybody else is keeping the law. Uh, years ago, I read this wonderful humorous book. It, it was called <clears throat> How to Be a Bishop or How to Be a Preacher Without Being Religious. 
It's a great little, I think I still have it in my study. It deals with a serious issue, but in a funny way. It's, uh, the book is, well, how to be a pastor or a Christian uh, and try to act religious, but down inside fool everybody because we're not really have a, or a person of faith. And it does it in a very funny way. So this morning, <clears throat> I would like to take a tongue-in-cheek. Now, you know what that means, right? A satirical, a humorous way of doing the same thing. And so that's why the message is entitled, How to Be a Good Pharisee. So if you are really wanting to be a good Pharisee this morning, if you're really trying to fool people about your faith, I want to give you six steps of how to be a good Pharisee. Wink, wink, tongue in cheek, right? So through some fun and through... Uh, through some humor, let's discover an important point, an important truth of Christ, that this is not how he wants us to follow him. Six steps. First step to be a good Pharisee. It's important to be religious. It's important to be religious. Now, don't think that being a Pharisee means that that you can just run around in public and do whatever you want. Heavens no. We need to be much more subtle than this if we're going to be good Pharisees. We've got to be religious, but we really can't mean it or really practice it in our lifestyle. When we have to learn to be regular churchgoers, but when we're in church, never fall into the temptation of really worshiping or really seeking the presence of the Lord. And we must be like the Pharisees of Jesus' day. And if you really get bored with the worship, because it's really not getting down in your heart, then you're allowed to intently look around and find fault in people around you. Okay? If you want to be a if you want to be a good Pharisee, that's, that's okay. And, um, and, and, and really pay attention to people you think are not doing things spiritual in your eyes. And especially pay attention if they're not Baptist. That's a real, that's a real no-no. Now, when something good does happen or someone is helped in some way, we've got to be careful that in the way we rebuke the instigator of this good disruption. And so just as the Pharisees condemn Jesus' disciples in the grain field and Jesus himself, we've got to do the same. Now, when Sunday's over, we've got to be on our guard unless someone through the week or at work or at school may discover that we go to church or claim to be a Christian. So it's, it's hard to keep our cover from Monday to Saturday because if they would discover that, they would never understand why we said some of the things we said or do some of the things we do. So we've got to be careful at work. And one last thing. Always be on guard and ready unless someone from church, especially the pastor or the youth minister or the music minister approaches, you've got to be ready to put on your religious costume and mask very quickly so that they think you're acting like a Christian other than just Sunday, okay? So to be a good Pharisee, be real religious, but don't mean it, all right? Number two. To be a good Pharisee, we've got to learn some good religious words, okay, and phrases. Now, it's not only important to be religious, but we've got to learn to talk a good game, okay? If we don't talk a good game, then nobody's going to really think that we're religious. Um, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you an illustration. When I was a, a teenager, I worked as a waiter in a Christian restaurant. It was a Christian restaurant in Newport News. Started, some guys in my church started it. And, and I walked around in a shepherd's hat and, a, a, and this biblical costume, and I waited on tables. It was really a sight. I wish I'd had a picture of it. But, um, but, but it was kind of a uh, nightclub-type Christian restaurant, so we'd have Christian music every night during dinner. So there was this one group that came, I promise you, the name of the group, it was two brothers, twins, and they were called the Amazon twins. That's what they called themselves. And, and they fit the bill. 
okay? They probably both weighed in excess of 300 pounds. But they were good. They played the cello and the guitar. They sang some great Christian music. And they were believers. They told this story. They said, when we first got in the music business, we weren't Christian. And we were going from bar to bar trying to find some gigs. And uh, so they went in this one place, and they noticed that the music for the night had canceled. And they went to the owner and said, hey, you know, um, um, we're, we're, we're a musical group, two brothers, and can we play tonight? You know, we don't have anything to do. We need some extra money. And the guy said, sure, but, you know, this is a Christian, um, this is a Christian club. It's, it's a Christian place for dinner and all. So they got, to, they got their heads together, and they said, well, we can pull this off. So they said they did. They got up, they performed, and what they did is they were all these great Christian posters on the wall. And so they played some of their own music, and they just made up the lyrics as they went. <laughs> and they'd sing the lyrics off these Christian posters. And they got through the whole night, and people were clapping and amening and praising the Lord, and um, they packed up everything, they got ready to leave, and they said, this one senior adult lady came up and said, guys, you know, Amazon twins, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I loved your, your music tonight, you're really good, but I want to tell you something, if you don't start believing what you're singing, you're going straight to hell. <laughs> Somehow she had the gift of discernment. And they said that woke them up. And they went and studied and thought about and prayed about what they were singing. And they came to know the Lord. But, you know, so sometimes Pharisees kind of, you got to know the religious words. And that's what they did, okay? So here are some religious phrases I want you to have in your toolkit to be a good Pharisee. You, you've got to know how to say Jesus loves you to people. But... The problem is you're probably really not sure that Jesus loves you. You need to be able to say something like in a very, um, in a very judgmental way, you need to repent from your sins. You've got to learn how to get the right tone there. And um, when you really haven't asked for forgiveness for yourself in a long time, um, we need, to, um, we need to all be able to recite the books of the Bible in order. That impresses a lot of people, especially at church. But don't ever open it up and read it. Okay, but you've got to be able to recite the books. Um, be able to say, God bless you and I'll pray for you even if you never intend to do it. That's a, that's a good Pharisee trick. And every now and then, I know you don't like to speak out loud, every now and then throw out a good amen in worship. You know, people will... They'll notice you, and they'll see you say amen. You don't have to mean it, but just kind of throw it out there every now and then, and it's a, it's a really good Pharisee trick. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Case in point. Now, have all these words, but uh, never mind that Jesus said that there'll be some to come to him one day and say, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say to us, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, Pharisees and hypocrites, we never really worry about that, much less believe it. So just go ahead and get those words. Okay, third, this is key. Pray, but only pray in public. Okay, only pray in public. Only pray when people are watching you or when you're called upon. And please don't forget your religious words when you pray. You know, those words I gave you before, they're good when you pray in public because people think you really pray. Now, be careful. Don't ever establish a quiet time or a personal prayer time with the Lord because you might find out that that's beneficial and you may not want to be a Pharisee anymore. So you got to be careful. Don't do this in private and don't do it in depth. Now, don't ever expect God to listen to you or answer your prayers because he might do it. Forget that Jesus says in John 15 that whatever you ask in my name, I'll give to you. Don't think about that. Just keep praying only in public, okay? Um, don't ever go into your prayer closet and beg for forgiveness from the Lord. But instead, be like your other fellow Pharisees and pray for other people who sin. That's a good thing. Don't pray about your own sin. Never praise God when you pray, but 
but only asking for your selfish list of what you want God to give to you. And keep praying for the lottery. It might come true one day. I, you know, I don't know. But that's, a, that's probably a good Pharisaic prayer. Okay? So kind of keep doing that. Okay. So we got prayer down. We got the words. Don't be religious. Number four. Worship the Bible, but never read it. That's important. Worship the Bible, but never read it. Now, there are several secrets to doing this while fooling everybody. Now, one way, and I brought mine today, one way is to carry a big Bible, okay? Don't carry a little Bible, but carry the biggest one you have, especially when you come to church, because obviously the bigger the Bible you have, you know, the, the more it means to you, right? And, and, the more that, and the more that's in there. So the bigger, the better. Now, the key is, is to carry this big Bible, but never share it with anybody else. Never share it with anybody else. Now, also, uh, another good point with your big Bible. Make sure, you got to go home now, make sure you got a large enough place in your house that when unexpected non-Christian people come over, you can hide your Bible very quickly. Okay? Because you don't want to see people that don't believe in Jesus see your Bible at the house. But, here's its trick is, is also, it's got to be a place that if one of your Christian friends comes over or the pastor comes to visit, you know you can get it out very quickly and put it on the table by your chair where it looks like you read it all the time. So it's hard. Now, if you want to avoid both of these, what I suggest is that you get one of these big ornamental family Bibles. Because everybody, everybody kind of accepts that. So get one of these big family Bibles, put some of your genealogy in the front of it, and make a nice display on a table. So even if your non-Christian friends or your Christian friends come in, it, you can explain it away. Oh yeah, that's the family Bible. And your Christian friends come in, you just kind of open it up to Psalm 23, and you know it looks like you just have it open all the time, and you think about it every time you go by. So there are some tricks to, to this Bible thing. Now, also, if you carry your big Bible, don't have it like mine. Mine's not a good Pharisee Bible. It's too clean. So what you've got to do is, is, is go buy your big Bible, and then go and kind of throw a little dirt on it, smudge it up a little bit, um, you know, maybe toss it down a little bit, get the, get the leather worn and, 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 and looks frayed. And um, I would dog ear a few pages. Yeah, dog ear a few pages. So those are your favorite passages. And, and then just go around the church. We, we, we're, we're not good about it. Collect some uh, old worship folders and stuff some worship folders <laughs> in the, uh, you know, in, in some of the pages or the front or the back. So it looks like you really come to church a lot and, um, and, and, and use your Bible, okay? So make sure it's worn. Now, if you don't carry a Bible anymore, then it's good when it comes time to read your Bible in church, but you have it on your cell phone. How many have their Bible on their cell phones? Okay, so pull out your cell phone real quick and pretend you're looking up your Bible passage. And that way people will think you're reading the Bible. Now, if you're pulling up Facebook or reading emails at that time, just hide your phone so nobody else can see it but you. But at least you're pretending to read your Bible. So that, that will work too. So I'd suggest memorizing the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer just in case of an emergency. But um, <laughs> never... Never read those passages and study those passages to see what they really mean for your life and how they can change your life. Don't do that. You may not want to be a Pharisee anymore. I usually would memorize John 3, 16. That's a good Pharisee verse to memorize because then you can say, Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian because God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten Son, who whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But don't believe in that because Jesus could change your life. And you may not want to be a Pharisee anymore. Don't claim any promises about God's word like Psalm 119 tells us or, or Jesus says in John chapter 8 that if, uh, if I, my word abides in you, I abide in you. That's dangerous territory for Pharisees. Okay, uh, number five. Keep your faith in the church building. 
Now, this is important if you're going to be a good Pharisee. Um, participate in worship, but never let your enthusiasm of worshiping God overflow out chur- outside the church walls. Never, ever invite anybody to come to worship with you, okay? Especially your non-Christian friends, because then you've blown it. You know, your costume, your Bible, you know, everything just goes down. So don't invite any of your non-Christian friends to come to worship with you. Keep it inside. Um, Respond if one of your church friends needs help, because that makes a good impression. But never help the poor and needy. Never mind what Chuck says about Matthew 25. Ignore that guy. That guy's not a Pharisee. Okay, we don't want to hang out with him. You know, uh, Chuck is, is living out the scripture. He's feeding the, the hungry. So, so ignore that stuff, okay? Someone else will do it, Wendy. That's right. That's a good, you're a good Pharisee. Um, when... Um, when you're, when you're faced with a difficult question or you don't know which way to turn, um, never think back on the truths you've learned in God's house. Just try to work it out on your own. I would suggest you go to the bookstore and go to the self-help section and get some real good secular advice. That's good stuff. Um, never let the least bit of faith go out of these church walls with you because if you even let, if you even have the faith the size of a mustard seed, Jesus says that faith can become very real in your life and you're going to be in trouble. You're liable to blow it and become moving mountains for God. And we certainly don't want to do that as Pharisees. And of course, never share your faith or what you believe with anyone, no matter how desperate they need it. Don't, uh, and don't be convicted by that Jesus tells us that um, the fields are ripe unto harvest, but the laborers are few. Go back to Wendy's advice. Somebody else will do it. Somebody else will do that. Okay. Last of all, aren't you glad we're at the end? Number six, never, ever think about eternity. Never, ever think about judgment. Never consider that that, um, that you, like everybody else, has a sin problem in your life. Everybody else does. You know, kind of be like that Pharisee in Jesus story. Kind of stand up, you know, hold your hands up, look up to heaven and say, I'm glad I'm not a sinner like that guy over there. That's, that's okay. Never believe that what you sow is what you will reap. Never believe anything God or the Bible tells you unless it can be scientifically proven. Now, that's, that's important. Never allow the good news of forgiveness and salvation of God puncture the hard shell of your heart or your selfishness. And, you know, certainly never let the Holy Spirit convict you And challenge you to be more like Jesus. Well, those are some successful steps to becoming a good Pharisee. Now, let me say this again, especially if you started listening to this on the radio in the middle of this sermon. This is a tongue-in-cheek, a satirical look of what we don't want to do, isn't it? The kind of people we see in Scripture that are called Pharisees this morning, this is what Jesus came to change, isn't it? You might have discovered, as I did, listening to this message, as I prepared for it, I realized that I myself have a lot of hypocrisy in me. And um, I can cover some of those steps pretty good myself when I need to. But it's been a fun way of of looking at a tragic reality uh, because some of us, all of us at some time, are just not living for Jesus like we ought to be. And when we do, we miss the rich blessings and the joys beyond our comprehension. So I really, truthfully, I encourage you, don't live a defeated life of the Pharisee, but learn to have the victorious life of the 12 disciples. 
and of faithful disciples of our faith today. And the way to prevent this from happening, the way not to live the life of Pharisee, accept the love and grace of Jesus, and then fall in love with Jesus, and allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And more times than not, you will not be practiced being a Pharisee. You'll practice and live the victorious life of being a follower of Christ. We're going to pray in a minute, and um, our praise team is going to come up. But if um, God has spoken to you today through his word in any way, um, you know, I'm, I am, Willard is, Alan, many of our spiritual leaders are always available for prayer and um, for, um, you know, for just helping you take the next steps in your faith. Uh, many times, or for some of you here, that may be accepting the grace and the love of Jesus Christ for the first time, or it may just, you've done that, but you need to just uh, make him Lord of your life in some way. Or if you're just praying today as we sing, just say, Lord, which of those six ways am I really practicing being a Pharisee when I don't really want to be? Help me. You know, help me to, to be just a little more in love with you tomorrow than I am today. And take some of that away. Your life will be great for it. Let's pray and then we'll sing this song. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming. Bringing us your grace. Bringing an opportunity to be forgiven. Given the opportunity to live the victorious life of the new kingdom, the new kingdom you have ushered in. May we hold on to you, love you, and experience the joy that comes from knowing you. I pray this for each person here in the name of Jesus. Amen.